Welcome back to Count Me In. I'm Mace Podcast about all things affecting the accounting and finance world. This is your host, Adam Larson, and I'm here to bring you episode 135 of our series with featured guest James Burton. In the wealth management space, a few can claim to have accomplished more than James. A 20-year veteran of the industry, he has held executive, management, and C-level positions at some of the most respected financial institutions in the world. He now serves as Chief Growth Officer at FinTech Trailblazer Personal Finance and joins Count Me In to talk about how to turn a crisis into opportunity. Keep listening as we head over to the conversation now. So, James, obviously, the global pandemic of 2020 caused the crisis for many businesses. A lot of our listeners felt this impact. Um, For you personally, I'd like to start off our conversation by just having you explain how did you help clients and organizations navigate through these difficult times, particularly in the beginning? Yeah, thanks, Mitchell. Um, You know, something like uh, the pandemic and and the initial market slump that, that it caused, that really that really makes you reconsider everything, right? All your assumptions about your business model, your strategy, uh, your growth opportunities, um, trying to to see into the future. And naturally, many of our clients went through very similar reflections about their goals and their financial situations. And they had a lot of questions about the future too. And the demand for uh, advice, financial advice and expert support definitely increased. And in this case, it turned out that that our company, Personal Capital, we were highly prepared for the crisis because we already had a hybrid digital and human model, advisory model. It's technology enabled to operate remotely. So in a very general sense, we just stuck to our knitting. Um, That's a British term, I think, meaning we stayed on strategy and we continued interacting with with our clients and supporting them through their financial concerns during the pandemic, particularly in those early, very stressful months. Um, But we also made a very crucial pivot to getting everyone uh, to remote working um, from home, literally overnight. Uh, And we could do that because of how the company was, was designed and built. So, you know, the result was that despite the initial market slump that we went through, we actually saw strong growth last year. Um, people, people want advice. Uh, they want holistic advice. Um, and they mostly don't want to travel to a brick and mortar bit building or office with wood paneled, you know, nice little offices. They certainly didn't want to travel during a pandemic, right? And, uh, and now, um, you know, a year later, they know that, in fact, they don't need to go any further than their kitchen or their home office uh, to, you know, to work with us. So we were able to help them uh, right away, and we were able to help them remotely, which was, which was great. And now, you know, kind of building on this conversation a little bit in leading up to our recording today, uh, I was told that you follow a quote from Winston Churchill. It's a bit of a mantra. Uh, and if I can just read the quote never let a good crisis go to waste. So, uh, you know, to help explain for our listeners here, why, what does that mean to you? How how do you go about using that as a mantra? Yeah. So, um, so Winston Churchill, he certainly produced a lot of great, you know, motivational quotes. And I do particularly like that one, never let a good crisis go to waste. I find myself using it a lot actually. And, um, you know, a good crisis uh, is very often a great opportunity. And that's because it's when you're forced to reconsider everything. You know, all your assumptions, your business model, your strategy, your opportunities, even your very survival sometimes, um, a really good crisis puts all of that in, in the picture. And as a result, it's often when meaningful change is initiated. And it's when we move forward from, from the past, you know, to, to the future way of thinking. And in the case of our company, as I mentioned, we found that as it happened, we designed and prepared very well for the lockdown, and we could commit to this <clears throat> virtual first approach. And as a result, we've proved beyond doubt that virtual financial advice works very well if you have the right technology and business model, and it's here to stay. So a great crisis here, which it really was, and in many ways still is, um, you know, uh, helped us prove that and move into a, a future uh, where you know advice can look very different for for Americans. And now we are, you know, roughly 16, 17 months through this, you know, it's been a year and a half. And um, you mentioned going into the future a little bit more. 
not every bad thing that happens is a crisis necessarily for business, right? We don't always face something like the COVID-19 pandemic. How can this mantra, this quote still apply on a daily basis? You know, once we kind of return to normal or the new normal, however you want to refer to it, um, can you give us some examples and and some response options for the daily ups and downs of business and, and, and responding this way? Sure, sure, Mitchell. Um, and look, you know, certainly these have been some strange and scary times in the past year. Um, but, you know, it's it's exciting to look into the future and, and see um, things improving. Um, I'm definitely happy to share some examples. But, you know, as I've thought about this, as, as you point out, you know, real crises and real opportunities, they're not exactly daily events, you know, thank goodness. Um, they tend to come along just when you think everything's going great in your business, like maybe early 2020, for example. Um, so, so every few years, you, get, you may get a really good crisis, you know, something really challenging or, or bad happens in the environment or, um, you know, in, in, your, in your business. Um, I've, I've got some examples of how to put, you know, a good crisis to work. Uh, but, but I have to mention that they're not really day-to-day examples. They had, a, they had to really harness the, the big situations. So if, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll happily proceed. But, you know, I, I generally wouldn't use an expression like never let a good crisis go to waste in the day-to-day environment, right? That's just doing our job. So i um, happy to proceed with, a you know, let's just say longer-term, bigger-picture examples. I'll go for it. Absolutely. Yes, please do. That, that, that's great. So first of all, I'd like to go back in the time machine, uh, maybe about 20 years. And um, at the time, I was working for uh, a well-known stockbroker based here in San Francisco. Uh, and the company had experienced huge growth in the late 1990s. Um, and then along came the crisis. The tech bubble burst in 2000. Um, you know, for anybody who was, you know, active in the markets at that time, you'll know that the market just bombed and, you know, trading activity and, and the, the interest of people investing in their financial accounts, it just fell off a cliff. And there was a lot of revenue pressure for, for businesses like uh, the one I was part of. And here's the thing. Clients were asking, what should I do? You know, they, they wanted help. And at the time, the company was known for being an online stockbroker that would execute your stock or fund trades. But it wasn't known for giving advice. And here we were with a situation where, um, you know, the, the markets had completely changed, the revenue dynamic had completely changed, there was a lot of pressure in the business, and there was pressure from our clients to help them in, in new ways. So there's the opportunity right there. So we responded by building out new uh, financial advisory capabilities to meet this demand for advice that was emerging from the client base, um, you know, when, when the markets turned. And what we started back then in a period of, of considerable adversity, now in time, it became a major part of, of that business. So that's, I just wanted to provide kind of a historical example of how some of these uh, pivotal market events in, in the financial industry actually can really generate a significant positive change if you can get through them successfully. So, so that was one example. Um, I, I've got another one, uh, which is about... Um, the company I work for now, Personal Capital, and it's a little different. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to um, uh, explain what I mean by that. So Personal Capital came out of what I think of as an industry crisis. By the way, it also came out of the financial crisis. Uh, it, it was um, founded in 2009 and uh, at the time of the Great Recession and financial crisis that started in 2008. And, and at that time, most of the industry was really falling behind uh, in terms of, um, you know, not, not providing the kind of experiences that other companies, digi- digitally based companies were providing. So, Mitchell, let me ask you a question, if I may, uh, just, just to, you know, break it up for myself a little bit. Here. Could you um, just give me a, a, maybe a company or a brand that you use pretty regularly in your life um, that has a digital component to it? Oh, sure. M- my wife always gives me a hard time of all the Amazon packages that we show up at the front door. It's almost a, a daily delivery for us. So uh, I'm a prime member and-, and Amazon is definitely something we use regularly. 
that that's a great example i expect yeah you know like like my home your driveway is probably like a fedex or ups shipping depot some days right oh, oh it is um, <laughs> so sam's nodding there so 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 thank you G- great example um you know that's that's the kind of service that many of us have found that you know we we, we wonder how we do without it, uh, having got so used to it. And if you think about some other brands like, I, I don't know, TripAdvisor or Uber or uh, Sonos or Stitch Fix, um, uh, and some of those brands we haven't used much in the pandemic, but before they, they were, you know, very prevalent. These are, these are brands and companies that cross the physical and digital worlds. And, you know, what they've done in their spaces is they've leveraged data and technology and, and in turn they provide us, the consumer, the customer with uh, information and control and choice, great convenience, uh, often great value as well. They undercut the existing pricing in the industry. And frankly, they transformed our experience as consumers, right? Um, and as a result, they grew exponentially. So I just wanted to you know, remind us of that background because by, by contrast, sort of meanwhile, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you know, I think household finance personal finance was was having its very own crisis you know when it came to the user experience and it was really ready for transformation and let me explain a little bit um i'll try and make this kind of uh pretty real because i think it will resonate with with you so you know a personal capital we have uh, almost three million users on the platform and um as a result we we can see a lot of um what they do and how and how they organize their lives. And we can understand quite a lot about their financial situation, which is how we can then help them. But one of the things that's really notable is that we see that the typical, um, the typical uh, household that's using the platform has about 15 financial accounts, which is a big number, right? And just, you know, think about your own situation. Maybe, maybe, maybe this will resonate. Probably you've got a bank account, you may have got, I don't know, maybe at high school, maybe at college. At some point, you got a bank account, you got a debit card. Maybe you got a savings account too. And then maybe you went to work for somebody after college and you got a 401k or something like that. Maybe you changed jobs, so you got another 401k. Maybe you were smart and you opened an IRA as well. And perhaps you got some credit cards along the way and maybe a mortgage if you bought your first home yet. And um, maybe you have an auto loan. Maybe you have a Bitcoin account. You know, it goes on and on, right? So, so you know, a typical household has this great sort of array of financial accounts, and you know, it's 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 a lot. And it, it's it's um, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the question is, how do you really understand your financial situation when you've got the stuff spread all over the place? And that's um, you know, think about the all the different logins you have to know all the different uh, statements you might be receiving and whatnot. It's just a lot to really put it all together. So most people don't truly understand their financial situation and they don't have that control and understanding that you would expect them to have with a digital revolution that occurred 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, um, So how do you deal with that? Well, maybe you can use a spreadsheet if you're motivated. I've tried it. It was kind of fun for maybe an hour, right, you know, um, and then, you know, and that's only if you really like numbers, which I do, and uh, and then it gets really tedious and, and it gets hard work to update it, um, and pretty quickly, it's out of date, it's dragging, you know, your, whatever you put in for savings and investments and values is old, whatever you put in for your debts or borrowings is old, it's very hard to keep it up to date. I think, you know, even very accomplished accountants would find that pretty tedious and probably give up pretty quickly right so so that was essentially what we saw as the crisis in financial services which was that just when life was getting more and more complicated particularly with the financial crisis um, people didn't have the resources they needed and that that was an environmental crisis so in this case looking you know more from the outside we saw the opportunity. The founders of the company saw the opportunity to, to really address that and change the way the industry works by bringing everything together for you in a dashboard where, frankly, with a few minutes, you can, um, you can enter your financial accounts. It's safe and secure. It's very important to people, by the way. And then you can see your net worth. You can track your savings and budget. 
and you can really understand what's going on in your life. So that that was an example of where you know what is essentially a crisis at the personal level for people can turn it into a really great opportunity to help them. I'll make a quick plug, by the way, if I may here, a little cheeky of me, but I'm a believer. So um, personal capital is, by the way, free. So the, the tools on the platform are free for everyone to use. And I, I would, I would, you know, I would encourage people to give it a try if you find it complicated to track your financial life. I'll pause there. Well, thank you. And uh, the examples you shared certainly do resonate with me. I can certainly relate to a lot of the examples and situations that you discussed. So, you know, definitely a conversation I think is very relevant to many of our listeners. And the more we talk about finance and you know, personal finance, uh, you know, this is certainly the audience. So I think that resonates very well. I do want to kind of continue on this track, but bring us back to the whole idea of, you know, crisis management a little bit. And a lot of what we talked about is opportunity recognition from the organizational perspective, right? We're talking about businesses and, and recognizing how to persevere and, and come out on top, um, you know, never letting a good crisis go to waste. So how about from this individual level? You know, you talked a little bit about individuals being able to take advantage of these opportunities, but how does it relate to the individual? And, and you know, even if it's a supervisor managerial perspective you know understanding uh what an individual can do during and following a crisis what what do you have to say about that kind of perspective yeah th- thank you it's it's a great question it's one i've reflected on a lot because i i do feel that some of the most challenging situations i've been in in my career have also been uh the greatest opportunities and you know so we talked already about how from a company perspective you know, you shouldn't waste a good crisis because it's when you get a chance to reconsider things. It's when change is initiated. It's when you start to move from, you know, the past into the future. But I think at the personal level, the, there's also a, a lot to this. I think it's when people are tested, they can test themselves and they get tremendous personal growth opportunities. Um, obviously, it can be in a very stressful situation, but um, if you can survive that, um, you know that 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 can be that can be full of opportunity. It's also when teamwork, your your team working skills, um, your resilience and attitude, your work ethic, they really count. You know when when things are, are difficult, and as a result, I think it's when uh, many careers are actually made. Um, you know, that's certainly been my experience. Uh, oftentimes, a crisis is really a great career opportunity, and in the financial industry, you know, in years like 2000 to 2002, or 2008 to 2010, or 2020, um, and we're not fully out of the woods yet either. Um, you know, you, you can really learn and grow at, at you know greatly accelerated rates relative to what you would generally be doing day to day when things are going relatively smoothly, because you're solving for so many problems and, and issues, and also um, you know. I think it's very exciting. You get to work in different ways. Now, sometimes you may work very intensely with people you don't usually work with. You know, teams are reformed. Um, new, new, new problems have to be solved. So people come together in different ways. Um, new leaders emerge. And you forge new relationships with, with colleagues or business partners um, that, can, that can be very deep and can carry forward for many years. And that can be very exciting and very rewarding as well. So, you know, these situations can be many different things. They can be a big strategic play, such as a, an acquisition or a merger deal. It doesn't matter which side you're on, it's going to be a very intense time. Um, you know, and you may be um, an owner or an advisor, but still you're going to be super busy and you're going to be working with new people. Um, it could be a legal issue. Uh, those obviously come up in businesses from time to time and can be very stressful, but again, require the same discipline of focus and teamwork and and bringing the right people together and also it could be a market crisis and it doesn't matter which of those it is my advice is to lean in and make the most of it in terms of uh you know what you bring to the table and the people you get to meet well thank you i know from an ima perspective through all of this we really uh emphasize the importance of upskilling and reskilling through all of this right we looked at this you know, last year and a half as a great individual learning opportunity for many of our members, you know, many of our listeners here. 
what can we do to better ourselves during this difficult time so that when, you know, that next phase does come about, we're prepared to take advantage of it. So, um, you know, to kind of wrap up our conversation, I do want to kind of build on that a little bit further. I'll ask you to take out your crystal ball if you could. And if you had to uh, offer up some advice to our listeners as far as crisis management, managing others, personal development, anything we've talked about so far today, uh, when it comes to preparing for the future, what is your stance and, and what would you like to share to wrap things up? Thanks for us, Mitchell. Um, that's a great question. And, and I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate to have learned so much from so many great colleagues over the years. And I try to distill it down and simplify it in terms of, you know, any, any perspective I, I would share to just really three things. And those three things are uh, your customers, um, your purpose or your mission, and the people you work with. And let me just say a few words about, about each of those, starting with, with customers. You know, so I've personally, I've spent most of my career working in direct-to-consumer businesses. And, um, but I think the same would apply in a business-to-business environment as well. And I think the thing is to be as up close and personal as you possibly can be. Um, and remember that, you know, your customer is a person or a couple or a family. Uh, they have hopes and dreams and fears, just like everyone. And they're really busy people. So we need to do everything we can to understand them, uh, what they need, what they think, what they experience. And particularly in a time of, of crisis and particularly in a time of crisis for customers, you know, really understand the problems they face and why they face them and get to the root causes. And if you can get to the truth as experienced by your customer set, that's incredibly valuable in helping you, frankly, at any time. Um, it should be something we all work on all the time, uh, but it's particularly valuable in a time of crisis or stress. Um, so that's, that's customers. I think, you know, if, if, if we do a good job of that, um, we can develop and refine our purpose, our mission. You know, what, what are we here to do? What are we trying to achieve? Um, how, how do we help our customers address their challenges and, and do better? And so a strong purpose is obviously very inspiring to us and to others, and it galvanizes us to make things better and drive for change. And, you know, if you have, if you have a really strong mission, uh, it makes work so meaningful and it makes your time incredibly valuable because you'll never have enough of it, right? You're just, you're just so focused and busy all the time. And, and so I, I do think that, um, and it's advice I give actually to, uh, you know, younger folk who are starting out on their careers um, is, to, is to find an organization where you feel very on board with their purpose and their mission. And you will find you are inspired by it and your time flies by. And so that brings me to people, uh, my, third, my third thing that I always focus on in times of crisis, but also any other time, which is, you know, for me at least, the people that we associate with, they're the single most important decision uh, you can make, or maybe it's accidental, but they're still the single most important factor uh, in, in, in how, you know, how things are going to go career-wise and so on. And the sort of questions I would ask is, you know, do we do we share similar values? Do we believe similar things? Um, do we have a similar ambition to to make things better and to drive positive change in the industry we're in or the world? Do we love to collaborate with each other and team up? Are we going to be courageous uh, when faced with a crisis and obstacles? And frankly, you know, when you're thinking about joining a team or a company, are these people? that we're going to enjoy spending potentially years working on something very difficult and challenging? Uh, is that, is that going to be a rewarding experience? And if the answer is yes, that's really fantastic. And the chances are, you know, these are the sorts of people who are going to see opportunities and they're going to be motivated to strive after them rather than just seeing difficulties everywhere, which is the other way of seeing them, right? So that, that's, that's what I would really try and synthesize down is, customers and purpose and people. And then sure, you know, you need to have the right kind of talent on the team. You need to have the right technical skills and expertise. I'm kind of assuming you have that. I'm more focused on uh, some broader things. I would also say you need to have the right planning and operational disciplines. But again, if you have the right people, those things will come. 
This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.